What's up, guys? Coach Dan here with trainlikearanger.com. And what I want to do with this video today is just kind of talk about what makes you, you. So let's talk about the human body, shall we? Our body consists of 206 bones. And these bones, the function is to provide a framework to protect vital organs and also the framework for movement. Now, your skeleton does not move without activation from a muscle. We have 600, over 600 muscles, each with independent, um, how should I say this, independent functions. So these muscles are all over the place and in order for your skeleton to move a certain way, certain muscles have to be activated. So again, your skeleton does not move without activation of muscles. And that is why, you know, when people ask me, hey, how do I target this muscle at the gym? It takes a specific movement to activate that muscle. So when you move a certain way, you're activating muscles to do so. So let's talk about our skeleton. Let's talk about what makes you, you. So we have this skull. Um, there's different parts of the skull, but for now, uh, we're just going to sum it up to the skull. Um, then you have your vertebrae. You have seven cervical vertebrae. So cervical refers to the neck. You have 12 thoracic vertebrae, and the thoracic vertebrae are easy to identify because they articulate, which articulate is just a fancy term that means forms a joint with. So it forms a joint with ribs. So you see all these ribs are attaching at the vertebrae. They're attaching at the thoracic vertebrae, and this forms your rib cage, which, again, provides a framework to protect vital organs, namely the heart, wanted to do different color the heart and the lungs those are the big ones so that is the function of the rib cage uh, and then you have your lumbar vertebrae so five lumbar vertebrae and then it articulates with the sacrum and the coccyx so let me go back up to the rib cage on the front side of the rib cage you have the sternum so you have the body of the sternum you have the manubrium which is the top part and then you have the xiphoid process, which is this little uh, uh, bony projection that comes down from the sternum. Uh, most everybody knows what the clavicle is. Pretty easy to feel. So you have the clavicle here. The clavicle articulates with the shoulder blade, the scapula. So let's go to the posterior view. This is the scapula. The scapula has a bunch of muscles um, that attach to it. And it, it's a key, key component of shoulder function so if you look at the front side this is actually part of the scapula too and it articulates with the humerus which is the upper arm bone this joint right here is your shoulder joint which is a ball and socket joint again a ton of muscles that um, attach to the humerus and there's a ton of muscles that are attaching to the scapula on the back side so um, we'll get more into that I, I could go on and on i'm trying not to ramble too much, but there's there's a bunch uh, of things going on around the scapula. So let's uh, let's move on to the arm bones. We have the humerus that articulates with the forearm bones. Now, if you look at this guy, he's in anatomical position. That means his palms are I'm going to say palms up, which means they're facing us. So this is his thumb, and this is his pinky. Now, an easy way to remember this is that the radius of your forearm, the radius bone, is on the thumb side, and on the pinky side is the ulna. And fun fact, whenever you feel the pointy part of your elbow, that's the olecranon process of the ulna. So, this fun fact there. Now, let's talk about um, we'll talk about, actually, I'll just erase this. We'll talk about the hip and, uh, and the legs. So articulating with the sacrum that we had. So this is the, the sacrum down here is your hip bones. So there's three parts of it. There's the ilium. So if you feel the side of your hip, you're feeling the ilium, your ischium, you can feel the ischial tuberosities. Um, that's your sitting bone. So this is the ischium down here. So as you can see, it's 
it's also labeled over here for reference but um so you have the ischium you have the ilium and then you have the pubis so that's the three parts of your hip so i should say pubis ischium ilium okay so articulating with the ilium is the femur this is the major load-bearing bone of the upper leg and articulating with the femur is your lower leg bones. Um, the big articulation here, really, really the articulation is with the tibia. Um, and then there's the fibula that is to the side of the tibia. So whenever you feel your shin, what you're feeling is your tibia. Your tibia is your shin bone. It's the major load bearing bone of your lower leg. The fibula, there's more musculature on, um, on this side of the leg. So you have the tibialis anterior, which I'll talk more about here in a second. And then you have the peroneal muscles. So uh, this is a meaty part of your leg, but if you feel the outside of your leg, you can feel a more slender bone in there. And that is your fibula. Uh, there's a bunch of bones in the, in the feet and the hands. Um, so I'll just talk about, I'll broaden it. So let's look at the feet. So you have the talus, which articulates with the fibula and the tibia, so tibia, fibula. Um, but uh, look at this one, your heel bone, that's called the calcaneus. Okay, and then you have the smaller bones of your, of your uh, hitting the undo button, bringing things back. Just use the eraser. Okay, so, you know, when you talk about these smaller bones, you have the carpals, metacarpals and the phalanges of the fingers and then uh i did it again and then uh here you have the tarsals and metatarsals and you have the phalanges of the feet so yeah, we'll get more into that in future um content whenever we talk start talking about specific muscles um oops so anyways moving on we're going to talk about musculature and i know this is what uh, a lot of people want to know more about. So um, it, oh, these things up here are important. And again, whenever we get into future modules, we'll go really in depth with, you know, what actions are moving what and where each muscle is attaching. But it's important to understand the skeleton. Um, you know, another thing is... I should say I should say this before we move on fully to muscles. Muscles don't contract without innervation from nerves. So here we go. You have your brain piece, you know, your brain stem, and then your spinal cord. They all kind of flow together, really. And what your brain and your brain stem and your spinal cord are is a complex network of neurons and axons. Then extending, again, these all kind of flow together, but at each spinal level, there's actually these uh, these wires that come out. Um, I don't know why I draw these just like literally coming out of the body, but uh, there's these wires that come out at each spinal level. So these actually run down the arm and um, brachial plexus and things. But you have nerves that come out at each spinal level and they innervate, activate everything that you do. So sensation, anything that you feel, any, any movement you make cannot happen without innervation from nerves. So nerves are literal structures. Um, I've, you know, in the cadaver labs, I've seen these nerves, which are bundles of axons that come out from the spinal cord, right? They're literally wires. Um, and, uh, and they run literally to each, each of these muscles. So as we're talking about muscles, they literally have a wire that runs to each of the muscles and it carries an electrical impulse that makes the muscle move. So um, the nervous system, important. And whenever you're strength training, you're not only training muscles, but the nervous system is a big one. You're, you're really training your body to be more efficient at space and timing of, you know, uh, electrical uh, recruitment. Let's talk about the musculature. You guys are like, please talk about muscles. Okay, we're going to talk about muscles. So, we have a bunch going on. Um, let's talk about 
everybody's favorite muscle, every dude's favorite muscle, right? The chest, the chest and the buys, the core muscles. Not really. We'll talk about the core here in a second, but uh, your chest is the major muscle on top is the pectoralis major. You also have one that's uh, deep to the pec major called the pec minor. So from the coracoid process attaches at ribs three through five, but it can be problematic if it gets tight. So a lot of people have rounded shoulders. Um, and again, I could, I could talk on and on about all the things that are going on there, but you know, I'm going to talk about stretching what is tight and strengthening what is weak a little bit. And commonly the pectoralis minor is tight. So you guys need to look up uh, pec minor stretches. And along with that, the pec major typically gets tight as well. But the, the um, pec major is the chest muscle. Now, you can tell what actions kind of target each of these muscles just by looking at it. So if you look at these little, you see these little fibers? So you can see them running along each each of these muscles. Now think, if these got shorter, which means these fibers are contracting like so, getting shorter, what movement is going to make that happen? And that's what's going to strengthen it. So we all know, um, you know, bench press and flies and things like that is going to contract these muscles. And you can kind of see how the different degrees of movement would target the different areas pending the fiber um, direction. So that's a quick and easy way to kind of understand the body. If you just look at muscle pictures and think about, you know, there's tons of content, but really if you look at these pictures, you can think what is going to make that move. And I'm going to put out a muscle sheet later. Um, be sure you stay tuned. I'll announce it on our social media, but the muscle sheet will tell the specifics each muscle and what movements make it activate so i'll get into all that deltoid is the shoulder muscle whoop so that's the deltoid um you have your biceps everybody's favorite uh muscle right core core muscle <laughs> uh deep to the bicep is the brachialis it's another um powerful elbow flexor so deep to the biceps is the brachialis um and uh, let's talk about the posterior set. So we got the triceps. So uh, let me go back here. Um, so the biceps, uh, I, I won't get super specific in every single action, but we know to work the biceps, you do elbow flexion, right? Bend the elbow. So if you were to bend the elbow up, uh, but the biceps is also a powerful supinator. So a good way to understand what supination is, is Look at this guy's hand, how it's turned palm up. Like, think about holding a bowl of soup. That's supination. So that's why whenever people are working their biceps, they do the hand turn as they're curling up. So they turn their palm up like so and curl. Um, another fun fact is the long head of the biceps actually attaches at the scapula, at the supraglenoid tubercle. And it does, um, it does some shoulder flexion. So I actually do an exercise where I turn the palm up and curl, and then I also do some elbow uh, flexion at the end. I also kind of extend my arms overhead as I do it. But anyways, I'll put out put out stuff on that as well. So that is uh, that's some general things there. Uh, the triceps is a powerful elbow extender, so straightening the arm. That's um, that's one of the functions of the triceps uh then let's talk about the forearm there's a lot going on at the forearm i'll just talk about i'll sum these up in groups you got the brachioradialis which is this muscle here now think about a hammer curl so make a fist turn your thumb up and then bring your your elbow about midway and flex your arm so your biceps you're going to see a a muscle popping out if you look down at your forearm, you're going to see it popping out at you. That's the brachioradialis, right? That's this muscle. Um, a good way to work that muscle is hammer curls. So when your forearm is in neutral, which this guy pretty much is, see how his thumbs pointed up and he does a curl. So you do a hammer curl. It's a good way to work the brachioradialis as well as the biceps. Um, so the forearm, again, there's a bunch of muscles going on here, but 
let's just talk about this. You have a wrist extensor group. So on the back side, as you can see, the back of his hand is facing us. That is the extensor group here. Um, oops. Then you have the flexor group. So the wrist flexor group is here. So if you're working on building up your forearms, you know, working some wrist flexion. So as you can see, as his hand is oriented, you know, flexing the wrist and then, you know, wrist extensions, um, that's going to work these different groups. So wrist flexors, wrist extensors, and then you got um, some hammer curls if you want to work your brachial radialis as well. Um, and then you have some exercises with some what we call ulnar and radial deviations, so moving towards the side of the ulna or the radius. Um, exercises that do that also bring in some of these uh, forearm muscles as well, but I won't get super in-depth with that right now. Okay. Moving on. So we talked about the arm. Now let's talk about the actual core. You got the rectus, uh, rectus abdominis, which is your six-pack muscles, or eight if you're if you're really doing it up. Um, so you got your rectus abdominis, right? And so to understand core exercises as a whole, your rectus abdominis is attaching at your ribs. So we talked about the rib cage before, right? It's attaching at the ribs and it's coming down and it's attaching at the pelvis. So any movement that brings your, your trunk towards your pelvis you know, usually these are, look at the, look at the duration of the fibers, you know. So anything that's bringing this, you know, this trunk into flexion or lifting this pelvis up, like there's exercises that lift the leg and bring that pelvis, you know, it's tilting that pelvis back. That is engaging the rectus abdominis. All right, let's talk about these, uh, these external muscles right? The, uh, the obliques, I should say. So you have external obliques and internal obliques. Really, um, really, and you can tell by fiber duration, kind of how they're making the body move. Like that's going to ro rotation this way is going to activate these. Rotation this way is going to activate those. But um, really, that's why I do rotational uh, movements in my core programs because your core is a cylinder, right? So you got the front side, you have this cylinder, right? And they, and it's also on the back side as well. So your core is a cylinder. I, I like to implementate, uh, <laughs> implementate. I like to implement rotational movements to work on these oblique muscles. Um, there's also one deep to this, uh, known as the transverse abdominis. Um, a good way to work the transverse abdominis, it's deep to all these kind of runs, uh, really like that, but, um, sucking your belly button in, that's uh, one good way to work the transverse abdominis, but that's, that's more for just overall core stability. So, um, the TLR core program implements a lot of these concepts. So that is your core muscles in a nutshell. Again, I could ramble guys. I gotta, I gotta push myself forward. So you got the quad group, right? So there's a lot going on at the leg, huh? There's a lot of muscles here, but let's talk about the quads. So a lot of people refer to the quads and I think some people think it's one muscle, but quad, obviously we know that's four. There's actually four muscles that make up the quad. So you got the rectus, um, rectus femoris. So that's this muscle here. You have the vastus lateralis. You have the vastus medialis, and deep to the rectus femoris, you also have the vastus intermedius, um, which you can't see it in this picture because it's it's deep. It's under those muscles, but those all work to extend the knee. The rectus femoris also does hip flexion. Okay, guys, quick audio change. There was something that I wanted to insert into this video. The iliopsoas is a major hip flexor, so it, it's comprised of the psoas major, which originates at pretty much all of the low back, right? So you got these transverse processes, which are these bony projections of the spine. They're the psoas major originates at the transverse processes of L1 through L5 and the bodies of T12 through L5. So in layman's terms, pretty much 
is connected to the lower back. So it originates at the low back and connects at the lesser trochanter of the femur. And this does hip flexion. Um, <clears throat> when you hear the term iliopsoas, that's because it includes another muscle, the iliacus. And this muscle combines pretty much with the with the psoas major, and that's why they're commonly referred to as the iliopsoas, which is like a combination of the two. So these are both powerful hip flexors. Um, and obviously this is on both sides here. So the the reason I'm pointing this muscle out is because this muscle tends to get very tight uh, on a lot of people, especially military people. I know there's a lot of military people that listen to my stuff um, and athletes too. You know, with with hip flexion, I mean, you're, you're sprinting, running, um, rucking. This muscle tends to get tight. And not a lot of people are stretching this muscle. So look into hip flexor stretches. Um, if you have a low back pain, that is a that is a common cause of low back pain and active people. Um, and really people who sit a lot too, this muscle tends to get tight because your, your hips are stuck in flexion. So like if somebody's sitting, this muscle is contracted because it starts at the low back, right? And it's connected there at the femur. Well, it's in a shortened position. So over time, whenever this person stands up and if this muscle is getting tighter, you're seeing some excessive rounding of the lumbar spine and it's pulling the pelvis forward. So that that's causing pain in a lot of people. So the pelvis is rotating forward because this muscle is very tight. The ilia, um, so as major and iliacus can both get tight. So, um, yeah, so these are the major hip flexors and the rectus femoris just kind of aids in hip flexion as well. So, all right, uh, moving on. Then you have your hamstring group. So your hamstring consists of three muscles. You have the biceps femoris, you have the semitendinosus, which is this one here, and kind of deep to that is the membranosus. And obviously to work hamstrings, knee flexion, so bringing the heel towards the butt. Any movement that does that is working on these hamstrings. And uh, we got, uh, yeah, the calves. So there's two muscles of the calves. There's the gastroc. This is actually, this one on top is a pretty thin muscle. Really the belly of your calf, uh, the, the bulk of your calf, I should say, is the soleus. And that muscle's deep to the gastroc. So people have asked me before, what's the difference between seated calf raises Right, so he's moving down. See the calf raises and standing calf raises. So that's supposed to be heel. There we go. What's the difference? So with a standing calf raise, you're working this gastroc. So again, that crosses. It's actually attaching at the femur. Um, so when you're standing, you're putting more tension on the gastroc muscle. And that's the muscle that you're bringing in. Uh, you are you are also working the soleus with standing calf raises. So you're working both muscles. Whenever you're doing a seated calf raise, you're working more of the soleus. So the soleus is on the back of the tibia, attaches at the heel bone. And again, that gastroc is on top and it's actually crossing over the knee. But whenever you're doing seated calf raises, you're working on that bulk of the calf, which is the soleus. So, um, fun facts there. That's, that's why people do the different types of calf raises. If you do standing, you're targeting them both, but you're putting, you're really isolating the soleus with those seated calf raises. So when you implement both, you're really focusing on that calf bulk. So let's talk about the back. A lot going on at the back. Okay, so you have, you have your traps, which a lot of people, when they, when they say trap, they think it's just like this upper piece here. Um, this is one part of your trap. Okay, that's, that's your upper traps. You also have middle traps. Um, really like right here. Middle traps, and then these are your lower traps. So, I, again, you can kind of tell by the fiber direction which one's going to do each area. So, shrugging the shoulders is going to work the upper traps. Um, rows, and really more with a, with a straight arms out. So, like, 
you've seen like bag flies or where the elbow is a little bit more open, that's really going to engage the, the, actually, let me redraw that. That's going to engage the middle traps. So anything that kind of brings the shoulder blades towards each other is going to work those traps. It's also going to work, since we're on that, it's also going to work the rhomboids. So the rhomboids are deep to the traps. So you have the scapula in here. The, rhom, uh, the rhomboid muscles attach at the scapula and to the spine. So you, you might have heard the cue pinch your shoulder blades together. It's really activating the, the traps and these rhomboids because pinching those shoulder blades together is activating these muscles to shorten them and bring the shoulder blades closer to the vertebrae. Lower traps are weak on a lot of people. So a lot of people, they're, they're tight in the upper traps, um, typically weaker in the middle traps and uh, pretty weak in the lower traps because the movement that activates the lower trap isn't a common movement for us. A uh, good exercise for this, and you can look up, there's a, there's a bunch of different exercises you can do. And again, I'll put out um, content on all these things later, um, you know, aside from existing exercise videos. But uh, the lower traps here is uh, is one that takes a sp special movement to hit. So look up Y raises. Um, I like to do an exercise where I lay on uh, on a bench and I actually raise my arms up to shoulder level with a dumbbell supposed to be an arm and a hand <laughs> so i actually from the floor i'll raise it up and again that movement kind of in a wide direction probably a little wider than this and that's again you can see the fiber direction if those shorten you know with that movement to happen those fibers are shortening to make that happen so i'm targeting the lower traps that way the lower traps are are important for scapular function so people might wonder you know why does that matter Really, a lot of um, a lot of our functional movement, and even on the cause of a lot of people's pain, is due from imbalances in the body. So, for proper scapular function, we we need to see a lot more rows, and a lot of people we need to see strengthening of the lower traps. And there's also other muscles I'm going to talk about. Uh, one of them is the serratus anterior. But before I do, another important group is the external rotator group. So. We'll talk about the rotator cuff as a whole. Um, let me come here. So there's four muscles of the rotator cuff. Easy way to remember it is the acronym SITS. You have the supraspinatus, uh, which isn't listed here. So I'm going to go ahead and write it in. So the supraspinatus is deep to the traps. It's actually um, attaching. So you got the scapula here. Actually, let me come up here because I can just show you where it's at. So... Boop. All right, so the supraspinatus is a muscle up here, and it initiates shoulder abduction. So when I say a abduction, A, B, think abduct to take away, right? So moves the arm away from the midline of the body. So when you're raising your arm out to the side, that's shoulder abduction. Supraspinatus plays a role in this, um, mainly the deltoid uh, the middle deltoid is going to deal with that abduction. And then, you know, the posterior, there's three parts of the deltoid. There's a posterior side and anterior side. Anterior deals with some flexion, right? So arm flexion, the middle deltoid is going to deal with that uh, abduction. And the posterior deltoid is going to deal with some um, extension of the upper arm bone. So, so shoulder extension is what they call it. So, um, you got your supraspinatus. You can actually, uh, you can see the infraspinatus here. It's not labeled, but um, infraspinatus is part of the rotator cuff group. You have the teres minor. And then on the inside, which you can't see it in these as well because it's deep, but on the inside, actually on the front part of this scapula is the subscapularis, which attaches at the upper arm bone about here at the lesser uh, tubercle. And it deals with shoulder internal rotation. Now what a lot of people need to focus on is stretching internal rotators. So look up subscapularis stretches. A lot of people have t uh, tight uh, shoulder internal rotators, right? So a lot of people have internally rotated shoulders and um, 
they need to strengthen the external rotators. So going back, we need to strengthen. Here's the, here's the two big ones, infraspinatus. So by the way, going back to this acronym, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis is the other S. So, okay, so uh, external rotations, a good exercise for external rotations. I, I have these videos on, on our YouTube and also links on our website, but I'll just kind of draw a little doodle here. Like taking a cable, you know, with your arm, your upper arms here, and taking your arm out. Jesus, doodles are a little rough, huh? Taking your arm out this way. So that's external rotations of the shoulder. Um, so again, reference those videos to see what I'm talking about, but external rotations is, uh, is an important thing. So a lot of people are weak in their external sh shoulder rotators and also, uh, the rowing mechanics. So we call it scapular retraction. So they need to work on the middle traps, the rhomboids. And then we talked about those Y raises for the lower traps. All right, moving on. Serratus anterior. Serratus anterior is the boxer's muscle. So that's the muscle that does these cool striations some people have up here. So you'll see boxers and fighters have really defined muscles up here. And that muscle does shoulder uh, protraction. So it does protraction and that's essentially punching. So you can look up different exercises. There's, there's movements that can engage the serratus anterior. It's important for scapular, um, scapular function as well. I'll explain why. So if you look at the scapula, what's interesting about the serratus anterior, we're looking at it, the side that's facing us, it's actually um, here on the medial border of the scapula. And it runs around. Actually, I'll, write, I'll draw it like that. It's easier to see. It actually runs around and attaches at ribs. And so that's, um, that's an interesting uh, interesting look at the serratus anterior. It's a punching muscle. So that's why boxers have, boxers and fighters in general have, um, have well-defined muscles there. A lot of people have weak, uh, serratus anterior muscles. So that is a, that's another common focus that people need to focus on is exercises that strengthen the serratus anterior. Another insert I have is the <clears throat> latissimus dorsi. So commonly referred to as the pull-up muscle. Um, I've also heard it referred to as the handcuff muscle. It kind of works that this person is in this position because what the latissimus dorsi does is extension of the, of the shoulder. It does adduction. So bringing things closer to the midline and internal rotation. So internal rotation. Um, so it's called the handcuff muscle. Cause like if this person has their hand behind their back, like they're going to get handcuffed, it's activating that muscle because, again, extension to bring the arm back in that position. Internal rotation, uh, whenever you put your hand behind your back, that's the motion. The humerus is rotating actually um, this way. And then adduction, so it's coming closer to the midline. So whenever you do a pull-up, you're really activating the latissimus dorsi. So whenever you're starting up here, you're grabbing a bar, right? And then... So people say grab wide, right? You hear the term grab wide for pull-ups um, and then pull your chin over the bar. That's because the mechanics of it is really going to activate this uh, latissimus dorsi. So, you know, as he's pulling up, chin over the bar, the, the humerus has to go back into extension. The, uh, the, arm is getting closer to the midline of the body. So that's adduction. And then as you're pulling up, there's also some r internal rotation of that shoulder. So these are all activating. These motions are activating the latissimus dorsi. So that is the pull-up muscle. Some people call it the armpit muscle because you can also feel it right here under your armpit, right? And kind of pops out. People do a lot of pull-ups. So, all right, going back to the studio, Mike. Okay, so I, I talked about the quads. You also have an adductor group. You have an abductor group. Uh, adduction, adduction, 
think add. So you're bringing a segment closer to the midline of the body. So, you know, everybody has seen those hip abduction machines in the gym. It's going to work this adductor group. So the muscles of the groin region, right? And then you have your abductor group. Really, people need to work on abduction. A lot of people. A lot of people have weak abductors. So let's look at back at this picture. The glutes does hip extension, which is bringing the leg back. So I'm trying to think of how to draw this, but you know any any movement that is um, bringing the leg back is working on the glutes. So even in a squat mechanic, I'll draw a guy from the side actually make this easier to comprehend. So this is the front side um, here. This is the front. So anything that is bringing the femur, the upper leg, back. I'm going to draw it like this, actually. Back is working on those glutes. Okay. Um, also, squats, right? Squats. You think if you're standing up, so when you stand up, this leg, this leg had to move back, right? So that hip extension, glutes. Also, you had knee extension, right? You also have controlled descent. So I'll get into those concepts later, the concentric and eccentric, but to stand up, concentric activation of the quads, right? does knee extension, which we covered earlier. So, okay, let me erase this. All right, so um, I've covered most of the muscles. Let me cover a few more. I'm almost done here. So the gluteus medius and minimus, uh, they deal with hip abduction, AB, abduction. A lot of people have weak hip abductors, so gluteus, medius, and minimus are on the outside here. Um, people need to focus on strengthening those. So let's come over here. Whoop. Okay. Tibialis anterior. Here's another big one I want to hit in today's video. Tibialis anterior is your shin muscle. So... You can see it labeled on this side, right? This is the tibialis anterior, is your shin muscle. What this muscle does, it actually kind of wraps around here, attaches at the bottom of the foot. And when this shortens, it brings the toes, um, actually, let me draw it the other way, brings the toes up, and it actually does some inversion too, which brings the, the foot in like this way. So people need to work on strengthening the tibialis anterior, so that shin muscle. I hear a lot of people talk about shin splints and ask me about shin splints. Really, the, the issue a lot of people have is weak weakness in the tibialis anterior and tightness in the calf group. So they need to stretch your calves. Of course, you want to have strong calves, so don't stop working out your calves, but you just want to stretch your calves. You want to stretch your calves, and you want to strengthen this tibialis anterior as well, so doing dorsiflexion we call it so toe raises so raising your toes up so raise your toes up and you can i like to draw it kind of this way because doing some of that inversion as well where you bring your foot in a little bit so bring your toes up and then in a little bit towards the midline right um that's going to really strengthen this tibialis anterior muscle so um yeah, guys, I hit a bunch of them. Uh, there's a bunch of muscles of the neck. The big one that sticks out is the sternocleidomastoid. Um, that one's actually tied on a lot of people. We have this forward head posture all the time. And I did want to hit this. This is the last thing I want to hit. A lot of people have this forward head posture, right? Um, where they're kind of looking like this. So as you can see, Sternocleidomastoid actually attaches at the mastoid process, attaches at the clavicle and the manubrium of the sternum. And so this muscle is tight among others, right? Like suboc suboccipital group is also tight. Um, 
the best way to kind of correct this forward head posture is just to do chin tucks. A lot of people need to do this where you, you literally just take your head back this way. You're kind of almost making it double chin, right? So kind of, I'm, I'm going to draw some ripples in the neck here, right? Um, you're not doing anything crazy with your head. You're taking it straight back. So you're kind of doing, we call them chin tucks, right? But you're not really bending your head any crazy way, like down or up. You're just taking your head straight back. So a lot of people need to do that to fix this forward head posture. Because we all look at our cell phones. You're, you you may be watching this video on, uh, who knows, whether I put this on YouTube, Instagram, wherever you're watching this video, maybe you're you're looking, you know, with this forward head posture right now. So another important thing. All right, guys, uh, I think we talked a lot about the human body. If you're still here, you're an absolute trooper. Um, I appreciate you tuning in. Again, I, I plan to put out a lot more videos. Uh, I really want to put out some some polished videos as well um, and tons of articles and content that cover this kind of stuff. I know I just kind of got in front of this today and rambled. So uh, ho hopefully it was uh, entertaining enough and hopefully you took some stuff away. So uh, you guys... Be sure to check out trainlikearanger.com where we have workout programs, nutrition programs, merchant apparel, and as always, much more on the agenda. I appreciate you guys as always tuning in and you guys out there training. Remember to train to your utmost potential like a ranger. See you guys.